Awesome. In that case, I thought we'd start off uh, with a quick show of hands. Who here uses iNaturalist? Uh, that can be, has put the odd thing up, has done a whole project, used it all the time, whatever. Fantastic. That's, I'm seeing a lot of hands. That's very encouraging. Um, I might, yeah, perfect. So just for a quick piece on why we thought this webinar would be useful slash how we hope how we hope to go about it. Um, as we've all been discussing ad nauseum for the past three years, uh, as our IVAs are crosswalking to KVAs and we're looking at not just the bird species within them, but all the species that make those IVAs significant for birds in the first place, uh, we need new tools for taking down data on more than just birds. Uh, that's the joke I have been telling for two years now. Sandhill cranes don't just love the Douglas Lake Plateau because it's prime real estate. They love it because of the ecological community that makes that place a healthy environment for them to feed. Um, and that applies for every single eye on the coast. And so iNaturalist is a tool for going beyond birds to record what else is showing up in places, uh, what other endangered species might be there, doing inventories, and more than that, getting the public engaged in these sites so that they can really understand what makes them so special. Um, iNaturalist is to biodiversity as eBird is to birds, with a few key exceptions. It doesn't collect abundance, only occurrence. So as any of you who've used iNaturalist know, it's not eBird where we say there were 60 Western bluebird. It is just saying there was, a, there was this one that I photographed. Uh, it requires a photo, as all of you will know, uh, or a sketch. I found it recently, the BC Data Conservation Center. If you can sketch what you saw, we'll include it in their uh, category. If anyone wants a fun example of that, I have a terrible drawing I did on my iPhone of a morning cloak because it was the earliest record for the Central Coast two weeks ago. Uh, so if anyone feels so inspired. Um, and then the part I really love about it is that unlike eBird, you, well, similar to eBird, you have a community of experts that weigh in on every observation you make to say what to say what they think it could be, to say what would need to be visible to ID it, to help you understand, and who you can then reach out to to say, hey, I don't know anything about comb jellies or mosses. Could you please tell me a bit more about this? Um, and because I think photos tell a much better story than me, I'll share a quick example of that. Um, so here you have a record I have from last year of a humpback whale that showed up uh, while we were on survey. We cut the engine because it got quite close and just floated there. And when it came close, we got these photos. We noticed in the photo afterwards that there was quite a large group of barnacles on top of the humpback whale, and we put them on iNaturalist, and it immediately suggested, just through its AI vision, that it thought it was a species of barnacle called uh, Coronula diadema. Um, experts such as Austin Smith here, who actually studies these, weighed in and confirmed that, and this led to a larger discussion throughout Southern Vancouver Island of what barnacle species are growing on whales and can only be found on whales. So as one tiny, tiny example of how iNaturalist has helped uh, or can help you figure out what you're looking at, I thought that was quite cool. Um, and then the other thing I really love about iNaturalist is it allows for much more backend analysis of the data than eBird without having to have a background in R or anything like that, which we will get to a little bit more. Or I'll give one another example here. Um, similar to this lat or two years ago, uh, actually hanging out with Jacques Tua, who's on this call right now, we had a record of a glaucous wing gull bringing up a bunch of fish. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if we had some kind of project to see what birds were eating in the Salish Sea? We put together a small project, which we'll go over a little bit later, which just said, if anyone finds a bird eating anything from the ocean in the Salish Sea area, put it on here and people will ID what they're eating. And so it's no comprehensive research project, but it was a fun way of engaging the birding community in Southern BC in, you know, let's not just look at the birds, let's look at what they're eating. Let's look at their habitats. Let's look at kind of what food systems they might be tying into that similar to the, like we were saying before, might make this area significant to them. And through that, we have had all, I mean, quite frankly, mostly records of glaucous wing gulls choking on ochre sea stars. I, I won't lie to you, but also some very cool ones of, uh, fish, mussels, bivalves, uh, flounders, bi yeah, all sorts of stuff that they've been able to find. And this took at most five minutes to set up, and then we just put the word out. So yeah, that's kind of a few examples of how I think e uh, iNaturalist differs from eBird. I think the really cool thing for what it can help us answer are questions such as where do species occur? As you know, you can click on any uh, any species and it will show you everywhere it has ever been observed on iNat. 
which uh, at this day and age has come to represent oftentimes a really good range map and has actually expanded many range maps based on where we knew they did occur. Because as you, as you can imagine, let's say for cone jellies, uh, what a team of researchers can find uh, versus what the entire community of people who are swimming in the ocean will find and happen to put up here can really increase where we know different species to occur. Uh, it also helps us inform questions such as how ranges are expanding. That's one that's specifically interesting during an era of climate change. We're starting to see more and more northern occurrences of species formerly thought to only occur sometimes south of the border. And because we get such wide community science coverage from iNaturalist, it really helps us uh, tune into that. It also helps us figure out arrival and departure dates for some organisms, uh, whether that be barnacles that only come at certain times of year, whether that be when birds are arriving, though obviously as we know eBird's a bit more robust for that, uh, and when things are migrating. And then my personal favorite, which species are occurring in an area. So I will once again give an example of an iNaturalist project which did that and will be close to most of our hearts, uh, the Skookumchuck Prairie IBA, KBA. So uh, Diane actually went and created this project on their own back in, I believe, 2020. I'm not sure, I didn't see them on this call, but they might be there. All they did was uh, take the IBA boundary, put it into iNaturalist, create this project so that if anyone observes anything within the boundary, they can see, we can see what that observation was. And it helps to flesh out the understanding. Uh, some of these things are, you know, plants that only come up for one or two weeks of the year or bugs that might just be incredibly hard to find. But, you know, if someone keys into it, there it is. Um, another example of how these are used to engage communities. Uh, I'm part of an online kind of young birders community called Red Bowling. We did a large fundraiser to see how many species we could find over the course of, I think it was a weekend. Uh, as you can see, we got just sort of 8,000 observations. Uh, and so through this, we could see what the most commonly observed species was, who saw the most species, who saw the most observations. Unfortunately, it was Ryan in both cases. Um, and then allows for analysis such as what species were the most common. So you can see here about 49% of all observations made by this group were plants, uh, insects, et cetera, et cetera, what the most favorited ones were. So this Northern Pacific rattlesnake, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the, oh God, I won't show that mute swan. That was gross looking. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of how some of these projects have been used in the past. I wanted to demonstrate quickly here just how easy it is to make these projects. So before I turn it over to Anne and James, I'm going to quickly show us how to create a project. And I'll be sharing resources after this that go into more detail on this. But really quickly, I thought it would be fun if all of us could create a project together right now. So what we're going to do is go to projects. We're going to start a project. And then I want a consensus from people of what we're going to look for and just show how easy this is. So this will be a collection project. Let's start with taxa. So real quick in the chat, if someone wants to unmute themselves and give me any taxa, so birds, butterflies, comb jellies, nudibranchs, whatever you want, someone suggest something. I'm not afraid to call names. Let's go for the Vela Vela, the small uh, jellyfish. Vela Vela. I don't How do you spell that? V E L L A V E L L A. Vela Vela. The, I'm going to go with jellyfish because I don't know how to spell that <laughs> or how that. So we'll go with true jellies. Uh, similarly, can I get someone to give me a place? So that could be North America, that could be Texas, that could be your backyard, any place that will have a shape file. Salish Sea. Salish Sea. And then we'll include everyone, so we're not going to filter by people. Um, with annotation, none. Yep, all of this is already filled in for us. We'll say any date, and we'll quickly go up and make sure we give it a name. Jellyfish Salish Sea. We're not going to use any photos now. Jellyfish! Exclamation mark. And done. Create project. And between that, in all of three minutes with terrible Clem2 Wi-Fi, we now have every observation of jellyfish ever made in the Salish Sea, so over 3,000. From this, we can see who is seeing the most species and most observations. Uh, we can see that, Mar no, I thought that was Marge for a second. Um, <laughs> but no, we can see all the species that have been seen. Uh, so it looks like these are the six species that are being seen in the Salish Sea. We can go and see a map of them, so where are people reporting the most? 
from here if it loads. Again, I don't have very good Wi-Fi right now. And yeah, so this is just a very, very simple example of how easy iNaturalist is to use to answer all sorts of questions and how by getting our communities to buy into this, we can radically expand how much we know about our IBA KBAs, how much we know about species and how their distributions are changing, and how invested our communities are in understanding that and preserving that. So I hope this was helpful. I am going to, if I can figure out how to start screen sharing, pass it over to James Paget now. How do I, why won't it let me stop screen sharing? Um, there we go. So uh, that was my little bit. And yeah, now I'm gonna pass it to James Paget. Uh, James Paget is the Species at Risk and Biodiversity Specialist at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Uh, working with the folks at iNaturalist.org, James has been the lead at the CWF in the creation of iNaturalist.ca, which is what we were just looking at there, uh, along with partners at the Royal Ontario Museum, Parks Canada, and Nature Survey Canada. He works on various species at risk and biodiversity projects at CWF, including turtle recovery work, rare, mostly plant species surveys, citizen science, and years ago got his feet wet literally and figuratively with vegetation surveys in eastern Ontario. So without further ado, James. Awesome. Thanks so much, Liam. Uh, that was a great overview of iNatural. So that's, that was a good, uh, good selling, selling uh, pitch there because I was going to get into some of that, but I don't have to. I can focus on some other things. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah, and I, I would mention too, um, if people don't want to go the whole route of creating projects, you can just you can also do species searches for those same types of things. If you don't want to go, like if you're not looking to kind of engage people and just basically wanting information. And I'll show you how to do that a bit after too. You don't have to go the route of creating a project, but projects is, as Liam said, is an excellent way. There are excellent ways to engage people and uh, target a specific um, location and species group and focus kind of thing. So I'll, I'll get into some of that too. So that was that was a great, great overview. Um, so uh, and I like I really like some of those examples and I was going to I was going to bring up a couple too and and of some of those observations like the barnacles that we wouldn't have ever known otherwise and it's just like one of those after the fact like oh what is this and someone else can come in and help identify it I think that's a really strong uh, feature of iNaturalist because it is based on photos and sound recordings as well um, for uh, confirming evidence of what that species was so that there's a way to confirm some of that those things that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, so uh, I'm going to get into uh, talking a bit more about iNaturalist um, and um, community science or citizen science, uh, depending on the terminology you're using. Um, a lot of people now are, are going more the route of calling community science. It's a bit more inclusive. Uh, so I'm just going to go with uh, going forward although I, I do slip up sometimes and revert back to citizen science. Um, as I'm sure everybody in this call knows, um, this is nothing new. Uh, the, the longest standing initiative probably is the Christmas bird count that started over 100 years ago uh, in the year 1900. Uh, started with 27 birders, 25 sites. Now 121 years later, we have tens of thousands of volunteers uh, throughout the Americas and just in Canada alone there were uh, about 473 counts covering about three and a half million birds just in Canada in 2022. So um, it has evolved and, and really gotten bigger uh, throughout the years, um, bringing to what it looks like today. Um, it's steadily growing, I think in large part due to um, digital platforms that can reach you know, many people, provide a way to easily record data um, and information. This, I, I always think of this as like a biodiversity and wildlife type thing, but it goes beyond that. Um, there's community science projects in uh, the health sector and geological information gathering. Um, NASA has a bunch of community science initiatives as well. So um, it, it kind of runs the gamut, but they all do have a common thread, which is um, basically it enables a data set, which is not possible to get by any other means. Um, so to have this kind of large mass of people helping to contribute data. Um, so I've got a couple of examples up here that I've I've thrown up, but I'm going to focus on iNaturalist. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all of these these other, like these platforms all have value. Um, I don't want to kind of say one is better than the other. Each one has a specific niche and need. iNaturalist, as Liam rightly pointed out, isn't everything, isn't be all and end all. Um, it works well for general um, point uh, presence observations um, that can be vouchered by a photo or sound recording. 
Um, it doesn't, you know, do lists well. As Liam said, it doesn't get at um, abundance. Um, it doesn't have, you know, spe specified experts. There are people who can help that, that are really good, and there are lots of experts on iNaturalist. Um, but um, something like Bumblebee Watch has only specialists that are identifying the bumblebees and, and communicate back. So, you know, there are, are needs and niches for all of these these platforms as well. Um, iNaturalist is in, in Canada, we are part of a global network of country specific platforms. There are about 20 across the world right now that have their own version like we do here in Canada. Um, these all feed into the, the, the global um, database uh, of iNaturalist.org. Um, so these, um, these country specific platforms allow the collection of wildlife observation by everyday people um, and uh, to record um, photos or sounds using the iNaturalist app or online. Um, and each country has their own version that all feed into this global database, like I mentioned. Um, we have nearly 10 million observations in Canada, 132 million around the world. Um, so it's a huge data set to, uh, from which to draw from for uh, biodiversity information. Um, we also share this data. Um, and the KBA initiative is a great example and it's one I use in, in a lot of my presentations as a great way that the um, data is being used from my naturalist. So I'm happy to speak to, to you folks as well because I do tell this as one of the great ways that the iNaturalist data is being used. Um, so I, I'm going to point a couple other valuable things. Uh, Le Liam mentioned some some points where uh, the data has been is valuable. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple others. This uh, is talking about uh, focusing on species at risk. Uh, we have the map on the left. That's a concentration or the uh, concentration of species at risk in Canada on the left. And on the right, we have the kind of the heat map, the concentration of, of uh, observations in iNaturalist. And we can see kind of the darker areas of iNaturalist observations line up pretty well with the concentration of species at risk. Um, doesn't mean everybody's observing endangered species, but it just does mean that there are a lot of eyes on the ground making observation in these same areas where um, species occur, which means it can provide lots of valuable information for that, um, for, for species at risk in particular. Uh, one of the ways that that does that is um, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada is increasingly making use of the community science data when um, undertaking their assessments on uh, which species are at risk in the country. Um, there, this is the, the expert body that makes those decisions uh, as to what is at risk. They provide that to the federal government that then decides whether to include them on the, uh, the Species at Risk Act or not. Um, these three examples in particular are some that um, Kasivik has, has used um, community science data, so heavily on eBird and iNaturalist and Bumblebee Watch as well for this for the bumblebee, but the barn swallow, American bumblebee, and grapple-tailed dragonfly are all um, assessments that have been done relatively recently, um, heavily relying as well or incorporating as well the community science data, which has led to the information uh, to um, designate or assess these species to be at risk. Uh, continuing on uh, species at risk as well, uh, the northern map turtle is a species that CWF uh, is studying. We uh, have been using the iNaturalist photos, so we've been going through the photos of northern map turtles across their range, which is Ontario and Quebec in Canada, um, to see about in Sorry, my headphone just died. Do people still hear me now? <laughs> All right, uh, I'm just gonna grab another headset here. Great of going, great thing about going wireless, eh? Is it's good when it works, and then not so much when it doesn't. Right, I'm just plugging some headphones. Thing about not wireless is they get all tangled up. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so um, back to the more northern map turtle. Um, 
So we were looking at photos of the northern map turtle in our naturalist to look at incidences of boat strikes. So we can see in the photos there um, anything that clearly looked like it was a turtle that had been hit by a propeller. Uh, we were mapping that and that coincides with the um, yellow triangles on the map uh, as opposed to the blue circles, which were um, observations or photos that, that appeared to not be injured. We couldn't see the entire turtle sometimes, so we're we're certain we underestimated this, but just not to be on the precaution, precautionary side, um, we were able to show that uh, incidents of propeller strikes are, are pretty widespread across the range um, from northern map turtles. And we've got a manuscript that's in prep uh, or actually in waiting for a publication right now as well on that. Um, and then new discoveries, uh, similar to the, the barnacle situation on um, the west coast. Uh, I love this example. This is the elm zigzag sawfly, the little critter there on the uh, in the photo. Um, they make this in this specific chew pattern in a leaf. Um, the first observation of this in our naturalist, the person basically just took a photo of the leaf chew pattern and posted it saying this is some kind of moth probably. Um, didn't know what it was. Experts saw this photo, confirmed it, showed it to experts in Germany and the US that was then confirmed as the first occurrence of this species in North America. And this was found in uh, in Quebec. And since then, there are, I think, about 500 observations now of this species in iNaturalist in Canada, um, partly because it drew some attention to it. So people were starting to take photos of random chew patterns and leaves, um, but also uh, experts started looking as well. Uh, so, you know, it's a great example of not even needing to know what the species is. It can be really valuable for conservation as well. Something similar happened with the European fire bug. Um, uh, the person I think knew what it was, but it's a, an occurrence, it's the first occurrence in Canada of this species. Both of these are potential invasive species, which is uh, not great, but good that it's found anyway. Um, this um, painted hen mud bug is a crayfish that is not invasive, but it was also found uh, first recorded in iNaturalist um, by an expert. Um, so knew what he was looking at, uh, but also posted it in iNaturalist. And the, um, uh, I gotta remember the name of this one. Um, the globe mallow was um, thought to be lost from Canada. There's been, there hasn't been an observation of this in Canada in about a hundred years. And it was found in uh, 2021 um, and posted to iNaturalist. So some great examples of some new discoveries that um, were made possible because of people taking photos and uploading things to iNaturalist. Um, I don't think I need to 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 get too in depth to to be the selling point of that you don't need to be an expert, but um, that's my my main pitch when I talk about iNaturalist to people. That um, basically, if you can take a picture, you can contribute to conservation, and this is great for encouraging people to contribute to areas um, like visiting KBAs. All you basically want people to do is take a photo and upload it to iNaturalist. Um, it's simple, it's an easy thing for people to do, and most everybody is used to, you know, dragging and dropping folders, even with it's within their own, own computer. Um, they can do that on the iNaturalist website as well, if they're not comfortable with apps. But um, there is a simple to use app. Um, it automatically uh, records the um, date and time. It opens your camera to be able to take a picture for you, or you take the picture, but it opens your camera for you when you click to add an observation, records the date, uh, location and um, you're, it allows you to add add notes um, about the observation. Um, it's one way you can kind of get it abundance. You could mention how many um, individuals you see in the notes. Uh, it, you can't really comb the data very well to, to get at that, but it's something that can be added in the notes. Um, you can also mark whether it's captive or cultivated. So things that are um, garden plants or not supposed to be there or that are put there intentionally by people, you can check that box, whether it's captive or cultivated. And you can set this here, which is called the geo privacy to, to, to define how it shows up on a map. Um, the default is for a pin to be placed directly in the map where your observation was. But if you don't want people to know where that observation was taken, for example, um, if you're in a sensitive area, or you're at your house and you don't want to have your house mapped every time you make an observation, you can change this and you click on that and you can choose to be obscured and it'll put a random point within a 15 by 20 kilometer buffer um, so that um, people can't see exactly where that observation was taken. But the benefit of that is that CWF, um, we have access to that 
when we do a data cut and it's secure, it's it's not shared um, to the public, but we can share that because of our 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 role in iNaturalist, we can share that for conservation work like for the KBA program. So we can share those those observations that people check to make obscured. We can still have access to those. Um, they can't after the fact then be posted publicly at a precision any better though, so we, they can't go and put, map that directly that specific observation in that person's name. Um, so there's a bit of a safeguard in there. Um, likewise, there's a, a website people can log in and, and um, add observations to the web. Um, basically, as I mentioned, you can drag and drop photos. It drops them onto this web uploader. If it was taken with a um, GPS enabled device like a smartphone, the location will automatically uh, there be automatically added. Um, what is not added though is the um, uh, an accuracy, which is important because if there's no accuracy, so the if you notice in the app on the left here, there's a little accuracy button or ACC that says 10 meters. So when you take a photo or take a photo through the app, it records how how good your GPS signal is basically, and it gives you a, a buffer of what the accuracy is. When you drag and drop a photo here, it won't give an accuracy, and um, we don't know if you're actually that maybe the GPS was wrong, maybe um, you were 100 meters away. Sometimes the accuracy is really terrible if we don't wait long enough to get a good fix. Um, so some of that data doesn't get used if the accuracy is really bad or if there isn't any at all. So um, basically, you have to click on this uh, field here and then kind of assign it an accuracy. Um, both the app and website have the image recognition software that Liam, Liam mentioned um, that analyzes the photo. It uses nearby observations to kind of hone in on what that species is, and it is really good. I'm shocked every time how well it can come to a decision on what species it is. It's not perfect, so of course we have to use our better judgment and look at the photos, look at similar observations, and not take it at face value because I've seen it get it very wrong. But a lot of the time, I think uh, the stats are I think 80% of the time the species is in that list that shows up. The, the the actual species, so it's one of those species, eighty percent of the time out of the time, and I think about seventy five percent of the time it's the very first one. So that's I think that's pretty good for something that can look at any and all species under the sun, including things like this snapping turtle here that you're only seeing a bit of the shell. Um, it can still get that pretty well. Once you click submit, it adds to your observations. Um, these are my observations around the Ottawa area, but then it adds that to the all the observations in the area, as well as the Canadian database. Um, this database can then be filtered, if we click on the filters in the top right, by kind of any a bunch of different ways. You can search by uh, species group, so if you're only interested in birds, that'll filter that to birds. If you're interested in a person, if you know your username, you can search by just those person's observations. Um, you can search by a more specific location, um, like your town, um, the KBA in particular, if that's mapped, um, as well as dates. And you can download the data into a, an Excel sheet that you can do more analysis with. The Excel sheet pulls the location as well of all those observations that you're, that you're searching. So you'll have a GPS or a latitude, longitude, and a bunch of information about those observations that you can download. Um, so this brings me to, as Liam was talking about projects, this is great because everyone knows how, how projects are and how to create them. That's that's perfect to get to that. If you go to the community tab, you click projects, it brings you to this main page that Liam showed about um, uh, where the projects are. Um, and you can search for cool projects like searching for um, key biodiversity areas. And I'll bring up something like this, which is um, something that Peter and Amanda have been working on. I think others, I'm, Sorry if I'm if it's not just you two. I'm sure there are a lot of people that are working on this um, that has mapped a lot of the key biodiversity areas that are in Canada right now, and um, they're they're putting more in. There's quite a few in there already. Um, this is a collection or an umbrella project. So basically, is amassing the way Liam showed his project. Um, that's one single collection project. This is adding all of these individual ones under an umbrella, and we can see kind of they're called the leaderboard, but which um, key biodiversity area has the most observations. You can search through all of them. You can click on the observations. There are already nearly a million observations in key biodiversity areas in Canada, which is amazing. Um, uh, and you can click on this and search by observation. And Liam showed the stats so you can see the breakdown of which um, uh, 
which species groups are most observed. Um, and then we can see the map of, of all the observations across the country. Um, and the number, if you search by species, it'll show you the kind of the most observed species in, in the key biodiversity areas across, across the country. If you don't want to click on a specific one, you can click on one and then get the stats for that specific project. Um, continuing on that same theme, uh, you can kind of get a two for one deal coming up uh, in a couple of weekends. Um, if you're uh, in an area with a key biodiversity area and um, also one of these participating cities in the City Nature Challenge, um, observations are automatically added um, to both projects if you're um, April 28th to May 1st. Um, this is a kind of global initiative with a with over 460 cities taking part in a basically a, a, a bio blitz type initiative um, uh, around the world to record as many species observations as we can. Um, I'm guessing that in just the four days, we're going to probably get over 2 million observations in iNaturalist. Um, so we've created a kind of a Canadian version to um, help encourage um, a friendly competition as well amongst our participants, but also amongst um, cities across the country of these 43 that are taking part. Um, and uh, it's basically a friendly competition to see who can who can get the most um, observations, the most species and attract the most uh, participants. But it is kind of a, a unified goal to track biodiversity around the world. Um, similar to the KBA project, basically anybody within these boundaries as long as someone uploads an observation to iNaturalist, it automatically gets added to the tally. Um, a couple of tips I wanted to mention to keep in mind. Um, uh, so things to record, animals obviously um, do remember that sound recordings are also, um, you can record sounds and upload them to iNaturalist that people can help identify as well if you don't know the sound, the call of something. It's great for birds and uh, frog calls. Um, not so great for plants, so you do need a photo for those. Um, uh, things like, especially this time of year, um, the bark of trees work well as well. Um, the image recognition software actually can do half decent at the bark identification, but experts can as well uh, do a much better job. Um, and it can be um, dead or alive. I didn't throw any roadkill um, photos up here, but um, this Queen Anne's lace can be identified from a photo, even though it's something from, from last season. Also, any other evidence of what we see, like scat, we know there was a moose that was here in a recent recent past, as well as a bear that had walked through. So um, those are valuable, valuable and valid um, observations that we can record using iNaturalist. Um, and um, we're mainly interested in wild things. Um, I don't don't tell people to kind of stay out of their gardens, but um, you know we're we're more. It's it's better that people record the the species that maybe visit their garden plants as opposed to the coneflower here itself. The monarch is something we want to uh, encourage more to upload to iNaturalist. Um, that being said, though, it is valuable to know which species um, uh, something is nectaring on, for example. So this is an example where we may actually want to include the garden plant. Um, we just want to note, um, as I mentioned in the, the options when we add an observation to the checkbox that can that you can check and note that a species is captive or cultivated and that's if you're adding the coneflower you would want to click that box a um, couple of things to make in making good observations um, bear in mind your smart smartphone can do a lot of really cool things and great things but getting a bird on this spruce tree from 30 feet away is not one of them um, so we need the right tool for the right job so in this case we would want to have a digital camera with a zoom and upload it that way. Um, also, um, multiple photos and multiple angles are needed for some species, so it's always good to get additional photos, um, but we want to keep it to one individual within an observation. So in this case, we have this mushroom growing on a tree. I wouldn't use the same photo to add the tree. I would take another photo of the tree itself. In this case, it's an elm tree. Um, so we would want to add both of those. And, but in that, this, this mushroom photo, we want to note or capture, in this case, we're getting a photo of the tree, um, what it's growing on, because in this case, this is an elm tree mushroom, um, or an elm mushroom, I should say. So it's pretty valuable to know what species it's growing on to help in the identification of it. Um, and to capture those identifying features, if people don't know what they are, um, basically anything that kind of jumps out at, a at you when you're looking at something, any stripes, any identifying kind of 
things that make it look a little different, even if, again, if you don't know what it is, um, those features will help others to be able to identify it. And to help with that, we have some resources um, in the help section. So if you go into iNaturals.ca um, under the help section, we have some resources that are um, guides to how to add observations, but also guides to taking better photos of certain species groups. We have these three species groups, but we also have um, arachnids and mammals and butterflies. So um, they're not going to identify everything for people, but it's basically if you're going to take a photo of a bird, here are the, the things you want to capture when you're taking that observation. Um, so those are all kind of one page or downloadable things that can be um, used and shared as well. And with that, I have uh, wrapped up. All right. Um, Thanks, James. That was a really, really good presentation. I don't usually expect to learn much from these sign presentations, but that was there was definitely some stuff in there for me awesome. as well. Um, some so actually something while I, I I can finish off on um, Liam you were mentioning the internet like that I like the bird the project of the what the birds are eating um, there is a cool feature there's there's I won't get into all the the specific there's custom URLs that can be written into iNaturalist and if if you if anybody's familiar with the iNaturalist forum it's basically a, a space that people can can ask questions about iNaturalist um, if you ch if you Google um, search URLs or um, within the forum search the search URLs in the forum. There's a couple of pages on like how to use these specific custom things to get more data and get like pages and, and results that you can't just search or filter through in iNaturalist. I think that's really valuable. Um, one of the things I've learned with that, and actually I can um, minimize this. Um, and I just was looking at it as you were um, as you were showing your project. Is this um, interactions? If you go to the taxon pages um, for, so I just checked Herring Gull while you were talking earlier, Liam. Um, if at the end of your taxon page, so if you go to more taxa info and you search for a, a species, I pulled up Herring Gull. If you write um, question mark test equals interactions afterwards, it pulls, adds this new tab in here and it shows everything based on the global biotic interactions database that it shows everything that this species preys on. I mean, this isn't this is still kind of a bit of a prototype, so I wouldn't take this as like everything under the sun. Um, that's why it's not there by default. You have to kind of search for it and add this question text test equals interactions to find this. But it gives you some information on the things that it interacts with, preys on, eats. So um, it's not there for every species, obviously, but a lot of them it's there. So just thought I'd uh, throw that in there too at the end. That's super cool. All right. Thanks, James. And yeah, like I said, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll have some time at the end of this. And uh, yeah, please take advantage of while we have these experts here. This is really, really cool information. Um, I did also want to add, uh, James, you mentioned about invasive species. Uh, one partner we have here in BC who's using that is the Invasive Species Council of BC, who we've worked with a bit. And they have an INAT, pardon me, they have an iNationalist project specifically tracking the spread of invasive species throughout BC. Um, for example, yesterday we found one of the first records of Himalayan blackberry here on the central coast. And they've already messaged saying like, hey, can you go back and get better photos and confirm this is Himalayan, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, it, like we said, we always wanna get photos of wild things, but just because something is introduced doesn't mean we shouldn't observe it. Sometimes that can be the most interesting observations. But, um, but yeah. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. Um, Anne-Marie is a friend of mine and is the IBA caretaker for the Fraser River Estuary IBA KBA, uh, as well as chair of Birds and Biodiversity Conservation Committee at the Delta Naturalist Society, one of the uh, BC Nature Naturalist Clubs. She's the author of two books, many reports, and innumerable articles on the estuary's wildlife, ecological history, and conservation issues. Anne has been on the board of many organizations, including Nature Canada, Birds Canada, Sierra Legal Defense Fund, now EcoJustice, the Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust, and BC Nature, where she was president for four years. During her time with BC Nature, she was actually one of the founders of the IBA Caretaker Program, which, so thank her for us all being here today. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I will pass it to Anne. Right, thanks. Can you hear? I shall um, try and put on my slideshow. Um, and take it from there. So now let's have a look here. I'm on the stage of just going to be a minute here. 
Okay, can you hear me all right? Wait a minute. Okay. I'm having trouble getting this set up on this uh, Teams. Peter, do you want to help troubleshoot real quick? Yeah. Yeah, and are you uh, are you able to find this? Is it a problem with the sharing button or uh, finding the window? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I can see my my slideshow, but I don't know if it's uh, if everybody else can see it. I'd like to just to be in a window on the um, on the screen, not. Yeah, we're we're not able to see the slideshow yet. Um, I think yeah. the share button should be around kind of on the top bar beside the camera and mute buttons. Okay, let's just in the that. Teams window. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. I thought I'd press that one, but sometimes I've got a a little light computer and it doesn't always, you press the button, it doesn't always automatically work. Let's see. Okay, maybe this will be better. Now I've got to put that on in there. I don't know why it's not coming up onto my screen. If you want to email it to me and start your presentation, I can I'll download it's, it and then I'll do the slides. It's too big to email. That's why I didn't because I haven't had time to reduce it. Gotcha. Yeah. Choose what to share. Usually I have no usually I have no trouble at all, but I'm I've done it Zoom nearly all the time. So Yeah, we had it just before the uh just before the call started as well there. Um, yeah. yeah, it looked like it came on okay. Yeah, the, the problem is during the share. So if you click the share button, it's the problem is after that or okay, let's try this one. I may end up just having to talk because <laughs> I just there's just yeah. no way I can do this. That would be fine. Really sorry about these technical difficulties. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I. Are you able to share screen. the whole screen instead of the a window within yeah. it? Well, I've got shares thing, and there's me on the screen. Okay, so if I put my PowerPoint on, that should replace me, but it's mm -hmm. not. It just isn't. So, so if you, you try on... sharing first, and then move your PowerPoint over top of the screen that you're sharing. Yeah, I did. I tried that as well, mm -hmm. but we'll try again. So if I go share. And then screen. It should yeah. give. We should all see your entire screen. Share entire screen. See, it's it's. I'm pressing it, but nothing's happening. Choose what to okay, share. Well, screen. Yeah. Maybe we can. Yeah, just, we'll we'll do the presentation. I'll I'll try and share screen as you go. If I can find photos of the brochure and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, can anybody see me down there? Like, we can see you, yeah. So when that 
but when well, we don't, we don't see don't your screen share. When I put the PowerPoint on, it doesn't it doesn't show the PowerPoint there. Oh, wait a minute. Well, we don't see you're still not sharing your screen to the rest of us. Um, no. So we see your regular camera, but not. Uh, not, not any screen share. Oh, that's a real pain. But we yeah. can what we can do as well is uh, we can send the PowerPoint out to folks afterwards as well. So if you want to just kind of run through things and then. Yeah, the trouble is it it's after. yeah, it's mostly pictures and. Um, basically, it's it's a huge file, so I, I just don't think it's uh, it's going to do it. I just see one more thing here. Uh, if you just want to do uh just do the presentation i can i found all the brochures online i can i can yeah. kind of screen share okay well <laughs> let's have a look here um Just as a reminder to everyone else, we'll stick around for another half hour after the hour. So we'll still have plenty of times for for question and discussions to you yeah. after Anne's presentation. Okay, so if you can hear me all right, I'll I'll just give, go through quickly what I was going to say. Um, thanks very much for that introduction to using iNaturalist. It is something that um, quite a few of our members have begun using. And what occurred to me while I was listening to um, your talk there was uh, the technical part is uh, obviously a learning process, uh, but not too difficult and something that I'm sure that in a few years time, an awful lot of people are going to have, have adopted and be using very regularly. Um, one of the things that I found interesting about doing our biodiversity project was the people side of the project, uh, getting a team together, uh, working together, helping people with new technology and so on. So our project was the Fraser River Estuary Key Biodiversity Brochure Project. And as I've shown this group before, uh, we made a number of brochures and um, have printed them up and uh, distributed them with the help of uh, several funders. Can I just have a check that you're hearing me OK at the moment? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. I hope you don't mind. I'm sharing photos of the brochures and stuff as you go. That's excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the face of Delta, I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody on this call, is famous in Canada for migratory birds. And there's all sorts of designations, the Wishon site, the Ramsar site, National Wildlife Areas, Wildlife Management Areas, the Metro Vancouver Parks, and so on. And um, there's a lot of other wildlife too that often gets overlooked in the excitement of seeing huge numbers of birds. So we have a group called the Delta Naturalist Casual Birders who have increasingly become less casual over the years, but we're still a pretty easygoing, uh, non-fanatical group, I would say. We have a number of photographers who come out um, and some of them have some super long lenses, so they take photos. Uh, since COVID, we've been a little bit more organized and less casual in as far as we have a sign up sheet. But even then, sometimes people don't come that have signed up and some come that haven't signed up. The numbers can range from about five or six people to 15 or even 20 on some occasions. And we usually meet somewhere locally and um, go out birding for a couple of hours. And it's it's been a tremendous way of outreaching. The word casual in the title seems to have brought many more people out who would have been perhaps nervous to come had it been just the birding group, because, which you know, obviously makes it sound like you have to know something about birds before you come. But casual birders meant people would just come and learn. 
And so we're sort of expanding a little bit because our casual birders are now becoming more casual naturalists and nature observers too. Um, some of us have always had an interest in other taxa besides birds, but there's so many plants and there are so many bugs and there are so many other species, fungus, for instance, huge one, uh, that it can be very daunting. Anyway, just to step back a little bit, in 2018, the Delta Naturalists encouraged the city to create a municipal birds and biodiversity strategy. And that was a small group of us that felt that Delta should be doing more to protect uh, the wildlife in its borders. And so uh, it took a little while, but we do now have this birds and biodiversity strategy. And habitat is meant to be protected. The trees and urban forest are meant to be retained. Uh, native trees are meant to be replaced if removed. Uh, the dikes are meant to um, be carefully maintained in such a way that species like the garter snake and, its, and their hibernaculum uh, is protected. Uh, farmland uh, conservation, um, there has to be a strong link between Delta uh, municipality and the Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust in terms of funding and support and so on. Um, we think about making our neighborhoods safe for birds and other small animals by, for instance, keeping cats indoors. Uh, we're trying to ensure wildlife and habitat are protected in parks. And uh, an upcoming uh, topic is green infrastructure mapping, which some municipalities have done, but which we're pushing the municipality to do um, as a next project. Um, we'll be speaking to mayor and council, in fact, in uh, a couple of months time. It was meant to be this month, which has added to the confusion, but luckily it's been pushed down the road just a little bit as I'm very busy. Anyway, in 2020, um, a small group of us within the Naturalist uh, Society decided to do a biodiversity project, uh, especially when COVID came along. Uh, it was a nice way to get outside and do something with a small group. So um, we got together and did the brochures and you've got a picture of the brochures up, uh, hopefully, so you'll see what, what they look like. Um, the first, the two on the right of the, um, if you've got the same photos I usually use, uh, birds in Delta and experience birding in Delta were done a few years ago. Um, and then it was the idea of expanding out with the uh, key biodiversity area being announced and um, the fact that we've got all these other taxa within Delta uh, that made us expand to a whole bunch of other topics. So plants, flowering plants and woodland plants, mushrooms, intertidal life, animals, butterflies and moths, bugs, and damselflies and dragonflies. And the way we did it was we sat around in somebody's garden one day and said, okay, who's going to take which brochure and who's going to be the lead on that? Um, organize getting photographs, getting the information, writing the descriptions and uh, generally putting it together. And uh, so as to avoid doing too much work myself, I, I was the coordinator of that. So I just helped by um, sticking my nose in everybody else's work. So we did uh, intertidal life in Delta almost straight away because it was summertime, we were down on the beach, able to find lots of interesting species and um, Chris McVit McVitie led on that one and, uh, and uh, we got that one out in time for the summer and people being able to go and see what was out there at low tide. What we did find, and it was no surprise to some of us, was there's a lot of introduced species in the bay. They come in because of the port and the transportation uh, mechanisms, um, but also some were intentionally introduced years ago, uh, like some of the oysters and things. Uh, but little uh, uh, species like the Pacific uh, mudflat snails um, 
they're, they're just everywhere on, on the bay now, and uh, they're a non-native species. We looked at different plants and we found the same thing. A lot of non-native plants uh, and some of the native ones are reduced in area. We've only had to search for them. Uh, some of them need very specific habitat like the sand dunes, but it was good to see species like large-headed sedge and blanket flower in, in good numbers. Um, the blue-eyed Mary is flowering at this time of year. Um, just dozens and dozens of species. David Hoare uh, led on the plants brochures and uh, he had his work cut out for him because there were so, so many uh, different ones. We had to have a number of meetings just narrowing it down which ones would be uh, the ones to include and how to divide them up. So we, we uh, had the flowering plants in Delta and then we had woodland plants in Delta. It's not exactly a... Uh, particularly scientific separation, but it seemed to make sense in terms of some of the open areas where people would go would require one brochure and the uh, a walk in the woods would require another one where you're seeing things like sword fern and Pacific nine bark. Terry Carr took on the, um, the bugs and uh, the butterflies and the dragonflies. I think he was bugs as well. Um, Anyway, we, we all went out looking for uh, insects of every kind, um, butterflies and, and dragonflies. That was some of the most interesting quests because it was amazing just how many species, again, a mix of native and non-native, uh, we were able to find and have still been finding on our walks since then. Um, and I think there's this group of, of uh, animals is particularly uh, good to work with for with the iNaturalist because the relias are so many that very few uh, field guides will have all of the ones that you're likely to see. Um, field guides tend to be too general, you know, uh, bugs of Western North America or something. Uh, whereas using iNaturalist was a huge help in identifying these. And it meant that as time went, <clears throat> excuse me, as time went on and we were doing more uh, identification and sorting through photos, deciding which ones to use in the brochure, um, we, we were going to iNaturalist more and more and uh, with great success. Same with the damselflies, a um, large number of those, and dragonflies. And... Uh, I have photos of these few, which I hope we'll be able to distribute later on the slides. Um, then the animals brochure, um, I started off doing that and then Pamela Swanigan, who um, was a great addition to our team as she's a professional editor, um, was able to take that one over. And uh, again, it was a matter of uh, narrowing down which animals we could uh, include um, some may not even be here anymore. I wanted the bear still on there because it wasn't that long ago that we had black bear in Burnsborg. And uh, even one time I remember finding scat down on the uh, a beach at the uh, east end of the bay. Um, probably with all the roads around Delta now, the mass massive highways and the vastly increased traffic, um, it's probably unlikely that bears ever wander into the, the Delta area. Um, however, there are a lot of small voles and shrews uh, that didn't quite make it into the brochure. But again, uh, with use of iNaturalist, uh, their names and, and identification could be narrowed down. And we do encourage people to use iNaturalist on every one of the brochures it's mentioned. After we'd done those brochures, um, we had a whole issue with children messing around with the garter snakes at the uh, hibernaculum. So we quickly put together just a single fold garter snake um, brochure uh, to tell, to hand out to the children and to tell them uh, to stop picking them up, taking them home, putting them in buckets, messing around with them. Um, and that's something that's just again happening now that we've got somebody down at the 
dike fairly regularly, keeping an eye and handing out brochures as necessary. So the whole program has um, of identifying species, uh, making brochures, getting them printed up, distributing them, and uh, I believe we've distributed over 50,000 brochures um, of, of all the, the different taxa. Has, has been a wonderful enterprise, I think, for our, our club. It's been really uh, eye-opening. It's taught us all a lot more about what we have in our community and has been a good introduction to learning yet more. And with that, I think we will be using iNaturalist more. I noticed just at the start that really none of us were using it. And now it's quite common for us to whip out, if we have a smartphone, to whip it out while we're on a walk or whatever and check on the species of something. It's opened our eyes to the wider variety of nature that's in the community. Um, because in the past we rather discarded a lot of the, the plants and things because there are so many non-native, it's about 50% non-native to 50% native plants in the estuary that we weren't we weren't looking as carefully as we could have but i think now we a lot of us are um certainly the the casual birders on our trips we we do tend to look quite a bit at, at what else there is around butterflies bugs and so on one of the things i'd like to do just in conclusion and what i'm kind of thinking we might do if i can sort of get round to suggesting it to somebody else to to organize or or maybe in in due course to organize myself is to do a park by park survey so or or wildlife management area by wildlife management area survey so that we've got um i've been thinking brochures but actually now i'm thinking i naturalist projects for each of those areas i think that would be the way to go um, we do need a few younger people because not a lot of our, our members use smartphone technology. Um, a, a lot of them like taking photographs and work on photographs, but then have to do everything a little bit more laboriously, uploading uh, separately. Um, I'm hoping as we maybe attract some younger ones through some of the outreach programs of citizen science, um, outings and so on that we're we're hoping to do um, that we'll be able to get more people involved and maybe do some uh, some different area by area um, lists but we'll see it, it there's always more that could be done in an area but I hope anyway it's it's given you a few ideas and I'm sorry that this uh, slideshow didn't work out I I've just been so really busy this last week that I just didn't um, manage to get it shrunk down and sent over to our organizers. So I do, do apologize for that. Thank you. Well done, Anne. And yeah, sorry again for the technical issues there on the slides. I hope people enjoyed the, the screen share we were able to do, slash it gave a bit of a idea. And maybe <laughs> Anne, if you can send the, the slides out afterwards, we can send those out to the group. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try and shrink it down somehow. It wouldn't, it wouldn't mail because it's too big. Yeah. One of the, yeah. the issues is a little bit that I've got to change my computer as well. So. <laughs> I, yeah. can, I can send as well like a folder that you can just drop it into because we have we have some storage oh, yeah. on our side. Yeah. yeah, that would be perfect. But thanks yeah. for persevering through, Anne. This is a really great <laughs> presentation nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And congratulations again on the brochure project. I have a lot of respect for the amount of hours that went into making that as successful as it was. I, I know as a kid who grew up in Burnaby, had someone handed me those, I would have gone ecstatic to finally know what I was looking at and not just be pestering my parents about what each fern was. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, for certainly my uh, my grandchildren, as each one came off the presses, because <laughs> I would hand them out, they would just like grab them and and you know would rush outside to see what they could find from the brochure. I think the idea of having a limited number of things to look for as well is is helpful for uh, beginners. You, you know, if you if you have a whole field guide, it's too much, but a little brochure with a couple of <laughs> folds is, is perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So like we said, we, we set some time aside here for questions and just discussion. I'm hoping this will be pretty casual. People will have some, some stuff to discuss. Um, I'm going to be around for at least the next half hour. Uh, James and Anne, please don't feel like you have to stay, though it would be good, I guess, if anyone has any questions specifically for James or Anne, now's your chance.